changes the DOM, depending if I'm, I am changing the DOM. But how does the browser execute the JavaScript? It renders it line by line through HTML. So JavaScript is an interpreted language, right? It is not compiled. We can simply create JavaScript in an OCAD file or any other text editor. We load it into the, the browser. And when the browser loads that page, whether we're referencing that JavaScript externally or internally into a web page, we execute that JavaScript line by line and we go through and the browser goes through it. Now, behind the scenes, there's essentially a, uh, a virtual machine, if you will, that takes that line of JavaScript, executes it, uh, compiles it down to machine code, and then executes on that machine, right? But all we're doing is we're essentially creating a script that we're passing to the browser and then we let the browser execute it. So there's a lot of steps that have to go through there. So what had happened was um, all the major browsers, they got together and they decided to create something called WebAssembly. And what WebAssembly is, is essentially white level code that allows me to be able to compile to that white level code and then the, the browser itself will further compile that down into machine code and then be able to execute it on the machine itself. And so we get low level assembly like language uh, with a compact binary format. And so what we're doing now is with Laser, we're no longer passing down HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, but rather we're compiling things into this WASM file, passing it down to the browser, and then the browser executes it from there. So it's a different paradigm of how we're executing things on the web. So JavaScript's native, right? Well, I mean, it, <laughs> as you just heard, yeah. It, it's, it's native in the sense that it's supported by all the major browsers, but essentially it's still a scripted language. So a script is really not native because it does get compiled into machine code, right? Yes, sir. Um, so why was there a need to, for WebAssembly to be created in Portugal? Why is there a need for WebAssembly? Because now, uh, that's going to be coming up in a future slide, I don't have to worry about Vue, React, Angular, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yada, yabba dabba doo, .js, and all the other JavaScript frameworks that keep coming up. I can now work with a language that I know, C Sharp, and I can create, I'm a, I am now a full stack developer just by knowing C Sharp. So just because of the proliferation of JavaScript frameworks, this is good. That's one reason. Okay. <laughs> Portability and standardization too. Details like that also matter, yes. Yes, sir. Is this compatible with open source languages like PHP and so WebAssembly, it's a low-level uh, bytecode that essentially gets run by the, uh, the browser uh, and compiled down into machine code. PHP is also going to be another scripting language that is also going to be interpreted, but it's outside of WebAssembly. Well, is, is, the C, is the C++ and C Sharp outside of that thing? Well, with C Sharp and C++, we compile it down to a WebAssembly file and then oh, pass okay. it to the browser. I How do you get around Uh, as far as preventing pop-ups? Um, no, preventing the, is, is this safe pop-ups? Are you sure you want to run this? Uh, she means SSL, the... I'm sorry? <coughs> SSL, like certificates and stuff. Like, okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> so with SSL, essentially it's how you're connecting to the server and retrieving these files. Okay. I, um, so, um, a, a lot of the different um, um, different languages cause a warning in the people's browsers. As far as a pop-up coming up? Yeah, it says, okay. are you sure you want to run this? This may not be safe. It has nothing to do with the HTTPS. Okay, so you're, it, it's not downloading a component, uh, it is the, the, the bytecode that's actually being executed. Um, meaning it is not like a silver light plugin. It is, you're downloading a binary file that is going to get further compiled down into machine code and executed via the browser. So it's still, how do you know it's safe? How do you know it's safe? Um, I, again, uh, well, what are you afraid of that the, the, the application would do? Anything 
Okay, so with WebAssembly, because it's uh, utilizing .NET, and essentially we're compiling .NET down into a WASM file, we're working in .NET initially, right? And in .NET, you can do things like update the registry, do open files, things of that sort. That functionality is not supported within Blazor. That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> so you don't have the entire .NET framework available to you, but rather a subset of that. Okay. okay. Um, did I see any other questions? Okay. So it provides uh, near native performance because, again, we're going to be compiling down to white level code. And it allows us to be able to work from three GL languages such as C, C++, and C Sharp, and be able to compile down into a WASM file. Um, it can also be designed to run alongside JavaScript. So if you have a lot of work invested in JavaScript, in Angular, in uh, utilizing any of the JavaScript frameworks in your current apps, this will still be able to support that alongside of it. And uh, lastly, the WebAssembly JavaScript APIs, they can load the WebAssembly modules into a JavaScript app. So we can do an interop where we can call uh, the JavaScript libraries from C Sharp and vice versa, we can call C Sharp modules from JavaScript. So they're completely interoperable. So we have WebAssembly as shown on the bottom. It's a so, uh, WebAssembly 1.0 and has shipped in all the four major browsers. And to get into more detail, we see that it's supported in a lot of the major ones. Some of them are still a little bit lagging behind. Uh, such as with Opera Mini, um, uh, UC Browser for Android, Samsung Internet, and of course our good friend IDE. Uh, <laughs> but that's going to be left behind, I'd imagine. So, sorry? Should be outlawed. <laughs> Should be outlawed? Yeah, I agree. So, what Blazor is not, uh, it is not a way of deploying a UWP or a Xamarin app, uh, it is not a plugin. A lot of people think that this is just uh, Silverlight making a comeback, and, and that's not it either. How did Silverlight run? Anyone remember Silverlight? Yeah. I loved that thing. I really did. Right. So how did Silverlight work? Right. So the first time you ran any Silverlight plugin, uh, I'm sorry, any Silverlight uh, app, basically what it did is if it didn't have the compact framework or the Silverlight framework installed on that machine, you were prompted in the browser. That was a relatively small footprint, but you still had to download it and run it there. This is not the case here. Again, the four major browsers, they support WebAssembly, so we're running almost natively within the browser. Did the server execute like, outside of the browser and the machine somehow? Did plug in? Well, because we download the Silverlight framework, uh -huh. so yes, it is outside the browser. So is this, this is still server side, correct? Or is this... Um, as we walk through the demo, we'll see both where we can create static files that we just simply send in to the browser and the browser executes it. And then we're going to create another demo where we have both server side and client side. Okay, because I, I was under the impression that natively all your browsers were only JavaScript. So are they turning into multiple languages? Because this would be C sharp, correct? Kind of multiple languages. And the fact that it's creating WASM or they've already supported WASM or WebAssembly, right? Okay. Think of it this way. Uh, if you've ever traveled abroad to a lot of foreign countries, English seems to be the, the universal language there, right? And that's essentially what the, the browser manufacturers did. They created a universal language that everyone can compile to, which is WebAssembly, and then they will execute that WebAssembly. Yeah, you could theoretically target WebAssembly from any language now if you want exactly. to build a compiler. Right. WebAssembly is not going away. It's always going to be there. <laughs> if I had a crystal ball, <laughs> uh, I would assume it's staying uh, because, again, there's a lot of other um, vendors that are building around it. Uh, so Microsoft is not the only one. As a matter of fact, they're a little bit late to the game. But they are building to it. They are gauging responses from the deaf community. And it is moving forward. However, they do stress it is not ready for prime time. There's still some serious capabilities that it's lacking, such as debugging. <laughs> I know it sounds kind of funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> How can you but again, keep in mind the current version is point three, right? Zero point three. So we're not talking version two point has been out. We're still in the experimental phase. 
So it's just a matter of, you know, is this something that you can see working? And then they're going to continue building on top of that. Now, having said that, listening to several podcasts in preparation for this, a lot of what they're saying internally is that we want to gauge customer response to know if we're going to pursue this or not. We don't want it to be another silver light. Right? So. Silver light was Microsoft. Right. This is not Microsoft. C Sharp is Microsoft. C Sharp is Microsoft. Uh, WebAssembly is not Microsoft. WebAssembly is universally supported. You see the difference there? So, WebAssembly doesn't have to be C Sharp. No. Okay. Again, you can just compile down to that language. However you get to it is up to you. Good. Okay. Um, continuing down the list, uh, it is not a new version of the defunct uh, script chart. Uh, it is not a transpiler. In the past, they created transpilers that basically you had C sharp code that then once you transpiled it, transpiled it air quotes, it would convert it into JavaScript code. This is not it. We're converting directly into WebAssembly code, or compiling to it, rather. And last but not least, it is not to be mistaken with Blazor, ER, uh, because that is a web browser for the Palm handhelds. <laughs> so you, if you're Googling and you're not careful with the spelling, you could end up finding something uh, that's not up your alley. It's hard to find Google. B-L-A-Z-O-R? With the O? Yeah. Hmm. It's not first thing on the list. Um, I, I didn't have a hard time uh, Googling it. I will tell you, though, that when I did run into issues, that was a little bit difficult. I kind of had to take some stabs, um, look at, I, you know, Stack Overflow is not overwhelmed with uh, laser questions yet, but it's getting there. Edge. I'm sorry? Bleeding edge. Bleeding edge, exactly, right. So, as mentioned before, the key advantage is I now no longer have to worry about developing or learning all these JavaScript frameworks. <laughs> and this is not a finite set of the JavaScript frameworks by any means. It, no. it continues to multiply and grow almost on a daily basis. It makes it really hard to try to figure out. My next job that it is. Exactly, <laughs> right. Um, is this going to take place of ASP.NET? So with the uh, with Blazor, it's running on .NET Core, um, and I wouldn't say it's taking the place of ASP.NET. I mean, right now it, it's certainly a parallel effort, but I wouldn't say it's a replacement. But then again, who knows what the future holds? Now you'd also have to think how much code out there is utilizing ASP.NET. Probably a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine them dropping support for it anytime soon. It's also core. Uh, part of it's in core too, yes. Mm -hmm. So, getting down to the brass tacks. In order for me to be able to run it, there's a couple things that are needed here. Um, I need to have the .NET Core 2.1 preview. And it gets a little bit confusing because I had um, the .NET Core 2.1 Preview 1 SDK, uh, and then I saw that there was an, uh, a 2.1.3 Preview 2 version 08533 SDK, and as listed here in this tweet from Dan, uh, this is Dan Roth, by the way, who's one of the, the key developers um, at Microsoft for the Blazor project. So was, what he's saying here is that uh, 2.1.3 Preview 2 um, is the latest as opposed to 2.1.5 that was a previous law installed on a user's machine. So it got a little bit confusing with the SDKs and the versions that you had to download. Uh, so in order to run the Blazor, you would need Visual Studio 2017. Uh, you needed the update for 15.7 or later. You need the .NET Core 2.1 preview as listed above. And you also need the ASP.NET Core Blazor language server extensions. I have links for those uh, for stepping through the demos. So this is to, to program it. It's not to actually run any code. It's both. Okay. Okay. So 
once I have those three things installed, now I can actually start and work with Blazor. And so what I did is I have Visual Studio open and it's a completely uh, empty Visual Studio. There's nothing loaded in my solution. To start with your first solution, go to New Project. No. Oh, you're not. Let's do this. So you can use Visual Studio Code now, can you? Not yet. However, that is in the works for future releases. And same with Visual Studio for Mac. So right now, Visual Studio for Windows and 2017, uh, 15.7 or later with the SDKs that I mentioned in the previous slide. Really confusing? No. Okay. All right, so once again, um, what I did was I had Visual Studio open. There's nothing loaded currently. Select File, New, Project, and then under Web, under Visual C Sharp, I have ASP.NET Core Web Application and ASP.NET Web Applications. I want to select Core, and then from here I'm going to give it a name, point it to a folder, and then I'm going to select OK. And then at this point, it's going to give me the templates and a few other selections. So, first of all, I have Blazor and Blazor uh, with the hosted solution. And that's where we're talking about static files versus client and server side. So first, I'm going to create just the Blazor app. And I'm going to select .NET Core. And for this one, I'm going to select 2.1. Notice authentication is not enabled for it, so I can't uh, run it with authentication as of yet. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And it's going to take a while to generate the files. So as you're doing this, make sure you have a magazine handy, so that way it has the time. Um, what I did is I have another solution that I created almost identical to that with a couple of modifications. So essentially what it's going to do is going to create a solution similar to this. There we go, the laser demo. And so within it I have several folders. You see that it's just one project labeled laser demo. Underneath it I have the dub dub root folder, the pages folder and anything shared regarding the layout and the, the navigation. In addition, I also have this program.cs. And anytime I see a program.cs, what does that entail? C sharp. C sharp, but also what type of application? Uh, back end. Console. Console, right? So when I look at my project properties, I see that this is going to be set as a console application. And I'm utilizing .NET Standard 2.0 for it. Does that matter that 2.0 and the other one shows this 2.1? Uh, this one, it's the .NET standard uh, as opposed to .NET Core. Okay. And so once I have everything situated, it created page files for me, and it created uh, just a sample app for me similar to what they've been doing in, in, uh, in the past with MVC apps. So I'll go ahead and run it as is. As you can tell, the initial load does take some time. This is a, this is browser should start caching the .NET DLL on the server. The yeah, the second time, right, it will be faster. So now I have a simple hello world uh, with a title here. I have another page that has a counter where I can click it and increase the count. And then I have another sample page that fetches data uh, from the uh, client side. 
So let's step through it in more detail. There you saw three pages. I have my home, counter, and fetch data. And if we look over on the pages, we see that I have counter.cshtml, fetchdata.cshtml, and the index, which is the, the home page. So first thing you'll notice is that the index, fetch data, and counter, they don't necessarily have that title. Rather, they're called index XYZ, fetch data XYZ, and I changed that deliberately. The reason being is because it utilizes routing, just like it does with MVC, in the sense that at the very top of the page, I have the add page directive, and there I'm listing the route, that this is the default route, the fetch data, that this is going to address the fetch data route, and then lastly, counter with a slash counter. And so the file names are irrelevant, but rather it's the page directive on top that directs it to where that path is going to go. So there's no other configuring with add another C-sharp file on there? As far as other C-sharp files, Nothing that uh, just that program.cs. I have a JSON file for the launch settings. I have my CSS with a bootstrap that I can utilize. Uh, other CSS files. And then sample data, which is a JSON file that we'll talk about in just a second. So um, it utilizes the, the page directive on top for the routing. And as you see, and let's go into my index page. That's index.html. We want to go into uh, index xyz.cshtml. So what I did here is um, basically they look at, with Blazor. A page can be considered a component, and I can also build reusable components inside of a page. Um, i.e. The, the function blocks. So here, there's something called a survey prompt, and that is accessible where? That is index. So here in my survey prompt.cshtml, this is also another page. Notice there is no page directive on top, because this is a going to be a reusable component. And what I'm doing with this is basically um, allowing it to display the, the, the prompt. So here, there's just a link for a brief survey, and then it displays the title up here in uh, Strong. So I have this function block down here that I can utilize, and if you notice that I'm able to parameterize this. So I, in the function block, I said that I'm going to allow the acceptance of a parameter, and it's going to be a string, and I'm setting it as a property, and then here is my default title. So if the user doesn't specify that parameter, I will set it to, quote, default title, unquote. So I'm looking at index xyz.cshtml. This is the page that gets called. Notice this is the default page. So here I'm calling the component survey prompt by just including it as an HTML element. And then I'm passing the title, how is Blazor working for you? And so when I run it, that 